So, Matthew 5, verses 1 to 12. Okay? It says this. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Blessed are the poor in spirit. There's two levels that we can look at this. We can look at it on a very basic level and say, he's looking at, just say that right now, can you get a look? You can look at it as a, on a very basic level, he's talking about the natural and how we should behave, and he is, he's talking definitely, this is how we need to behave. This is the character that we need to have. That's what he's talking about now. But he's telling you that each, each of these things comes with a blessing. But I'm going to tell you now there's a deeper meaning to this. There's a spiritual meaning behind a lot of this. And that's what we need to be looking towards. Okay? Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Let's start off very simply. Blessed. Simply means this. Fully satisfied right now. It also means that there's a blessedness coming in the hereafter. So it's on two levels. First of all, the blessing is for now, and there's going to be a second blessing when we get to heaven. You are a blessed people. Okay? Blessed simply implies a state of happiness. The early church was often described as a happy people, a joyful people. We need, that's what we need to do. We need to have that divine joy, that perfect happiness. Blessed. Jesus was saying that you are happy and fortunate. And these are the qualities that you need to have. He's not saying you need to be poor and have no money. He's saying this, you need to be poor in spirit. What does that mean? It means like a helpless person. If you have no money, you can't spend money. Okay? If you're poor, you're unable to help yourself out of the situation. That's what it means. If you are poor in spirit, you are unable to help yourself out of this, this situation. So what you need is somebody who is spiritually more powerful than you. And the Bible says there is power in the name of Jesus. Okay? Now, there's an article in um, Christianity Today. I know. I know. And it simply says this. Um, I'm not going to read all of it, but it's a title, What Makes the Poor Deserving of God's Concern? And it says this, it's an article written by a lady called Monica Helwig, and it lists the advantages of being poor. And you think, well, there are no advantages to being poor, I can't get what I want. Here they are. Number one, the poor know that they are in urgent need of redemption. They know they can't do it, they need somebody to redeem them. Number two, the poor are not, 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 not only their independence on God and on powerful people, but also their interdependence with one another. It's a well-known um, fact that if you have nothing, the, the communities with nothing are willing to share everything one with another. But the more you have, the more you want. The more you want for yourself. 
So the advantage to being poor is this. You know you're poor, you know you can't do it yourself, but you're willing to share because you've not got much and you, the people around you have not got much. Number three, the poor rest their security not on things, but on people. Who is going to help him? Number four, the poor have no exaggerated sense of their own importance. And they have no exaggerated need of privacy. They will share anything. When I was growing up, we lived in a terrace house, and many nights the doors would not be locked. We didn't have anything to steal. Or it didn't feel like we had anything to steal. I don't think the neighbours locked their doors. If the neighbours wanted something, they would walk in our house like it was theirs. We had nothing. We didn't need to be private about them, what we had because it was obvious we had nothing. It was obvious that nobody had nothing. When I was growing up, I remember there was a, a long road, they were about this long road terrace house, and I think there were only two cars on the whole street. Change now. Now we've got stuff, we all want stuff. And we want better stuff. And we want more stuff. The poor expect little from competition and much from cooperation. I look at the churches in these other countries where they have nothing and they're poor like you think. They have more than us. I look at this country and everybody's trying to hold on to what we've got. The, number six, the poor can distinguish between necessities and luxuries. We were talking before and I was saying bread is a staple of our diet. Bread is a staple of our diet. So when somebody says to me I don't want bread, that's because they've got a higher expectation of their level of uh, the, 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 the level of living. I don't want bread. I want couscous. I don't want this. I want that. I don't want an apple. I want pineapple. So they differ between luxuries and necessities. We're talking on two levels here. We're talking about just to survive in the natural and the spiritual. What is a necessity and what's a luxury? It's a necessity that we know God. It's a necessity that we accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and Saviour. It's a luxury that we sit in a nice warm building, well lit, with speakers and sound desks and projectors. It's a luxury. But it's not a necessity. The poor in spirit know that they need God. They do not need all of this happening. I pray to God that He's given them much, but I don't for a second think they're a necessity. Seven, the poor can wait because they have acquired a kind of patience born of dependence. They have no choice. They're used to waiting to receive. I don't find myself in that position sometimes. Um, a couple of years ago, I watched a machine grow, and we just went, let's go buy another one. We didn't have to wait months saving. We didn't have to go to the laundrette, which meant that it'd be even longer because we had to spend money to make some of it profit. But what we did is we had the ability to be able to go and buy. We had the luxury. We weren't having to wait. Number eight, coming to the end of this list, the fears of the poor are more realistic and less exaggerated because they already know that no that, that one can survive great suffering and want. If your belly's empty today. It's not a problem because you know that the day before yesterday it was empty, but yesterday you ate. You know there's something coming. 
here we go now, number nine. When the poor have the gospel preached to them, it sounds like good news and not like a threat or a story. It's good news. It's life-saving. And instead, we have a people that sometimes they look at it and they go, oh, we went to, a few years ago, we went to a Christian meeting. And I loved it. The man was telling us what we were doing wrong and what we should be doing. And as we were walking out, half the people were going, I didn't like that, the way he was having a go at us. And I was thinking, man, he's just pointed out the problems in my life and I'm going to solve them. And everybody else is thinking, he just had a go at us. God's not trying to scold us, he's trying to save us. He's saving us from ourselves. Number 10, the poor can respond to the call of the gospel with an abandonment and uncomplicated totality because they have so little to lose and are ready for anything. If you have a lot to give up, like the rich man, it's a hard thing to do. If you have nothing to give up, it's an easy thing to say, take all I have, all I am, take it now, Lord. But if you've got a lot, it's hard to go, take some of what I've got. Some of what I've got. The article goes on to say, poor people find themselves in a posture that befits the grace of God. Jesus came for the abandoned, the lost, the lonely, the poor in spirit. He came, he says, in their state of neediness, dependence, and dissatisfaction with life, they may welcome God's free gift of love. It's easy to reach people with nothing. Now, here's what God wears on my heart. When I look out of the window, I see those fine houses, and I see those nice cars, and I see people with wealth and money. And I look at them and I think, these are a poor people, spiritually poor. Financially well off, spiritually poor. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven, but only if they receive Christ. It doesn't matter how much you've got. We need, first of all, to recognize that every blessing we have, when it says blessed are the poor in spirit, that blessedness, that's us. We need to realize that we are the poor in spirit, that we don't have the strength to do it. Who does? Christ. In Christ alone, in my hope is found. We need to rely on Christ alone. Moses, he and the people with him, said this in Exodus, The Lord is my strength and my defense. He has become my salvation. He is my God. I will praise him, my father's God, and I will exalt him. He is my strength. The Lord is my strength. I am poor. I cannot do this of my own strength. My spirit will not manage. 2 Corinthians says, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Don't think that you're strong and mighty in God. Understand that you are weak. And that you need God. Ephesians says this, finally, finally, be strong in the Lord and his mighty power. Why? Because each blessing he has for you has a reward. Blessed are the poor in spirit. What do they receive? But theirs is the kingdom of heaven. If you rely on God a little bit, you are getting to heaven. If you accept Christ as your Lord and Savior, and yet you sit in church and think there are so many powerful people around me, there are men and women of God that, that make me look tiny, doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. Your place is in the kingdom of heaven. I 
I like that bit that says the first should be last. The wow. Every blessing promises a future reward. Okay? Verse 4 says, Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Now, I could tell you, oh, well, it's about those people that have died and, you know, it's don't be upset for the lost. And it is. The physical world says you need comfort when somebody's passed on. As the body of Christ, if, somebody, if something's happening in somebody's life and they're upset, we should be ministering one to another. You know? In the physical and the spiritual. Because here's the second bit of that. Okay? Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. What about the spiritual? What about those who have died in the spirit? Each one of us, if we accept Christ as Lord and Saviour, have died. We've died to self. Each one of us will still look back and regret our past lives. Each one of us will be brought to tears by the things that we've done. Jesus says this, I tell you the truth, no one can see the kingdom of God unless he is born again. The old is gone. Here comes the new. Okay? He said, I tell you the truth, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless he is born of water and of the spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the spirit gives birth to spirit. The Corinthians said, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has gone, the new has come. We will mourn over our past lives. Because I, I've seen people in church that every time they, you mention the name Jesus, they burst into tears. Because they remember the life they lived. They remember the way they were. They mourn over the things that they have done. The, the, the sorrow they feel. But we don't need to. Because we're caught all blessed are there that mourn, for they will be comforted. In the physical, we will look after one another. But God, he's going to look after the spiritual. Do you know what he's going to do? He's going to provide somebody to do that for you. Who? If you love me, you will obey what I command, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another counsel to be with you forever. The spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him or knows him. But you know him, for he lives with you and will be in you. This is the air I breathe. This is the air I breathe. Now, a counsellor, depending on which Bible you're reading, but I'm going to just tell you now, counsellor in Greek means paracletus. Paracletus, that's what a counsellor is. But this is the job of a paracletus. A comforter, an encourager, an exhorter on Christ's behalf. Paracletus, one who stands in the stead of. Not lesser, but equal to. Representative of another. Of equal quality. That's what it says. Of equal quality. It's, in Greek, it's called halos. It means equal. When Jesus said, I am going and I will leave another, he's not saying, I am going and here's an inferior version. He's saying, I am going and here is one equal to me. Equal. And he will comfort you. He will guide you. He will teach you. He will counsel you. Paracletus. He will comfort you. In the natural room, look after one another. We will have one another's backs. And God will have our spiritual back and comfort us. Whether we're upset, 
spiritual human complication. Next one. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Meek means quiet, gentle, easily imposed on. And here's another word, submissive. Jesus stood before the Sanhedrin and Pilate, and he was quiet. And he was moved. Because Isaiah had said he was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before its shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. Why? Because Jesus submitted to God's will. He was submissive. He was meek. My favourite verse in the Bible. Submit to God. Say that to him in this version. Submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. The devil is the prince of the earth, but Jesus has defeated him. How? He submits to God's will. Don't think highly of yourself. Walk gently. There used to be a saying at work, walk gently but carry a big stick. Well, I'm going to say no, just walk gently. Walk gently and be prepared to be nailed to that stick. And you will re receive your reward. You will inherit the earth. Now and forever. Why? In Revelation it says, that we, it doesn't say we, it says we, we reign on the earth. Why? Because in Revelation 5 9 it says, and they sang a new song. You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seal because you were slain, and with your blood you purchased men to God from every tribe and language and people and nation. And then it goes on to say, You have made them to be a kingdom and priests to serve our God, and they will reign on the earth. When you get to heaven, you will receive your reward. You will inherit the earth. You will be. Oh, what's the word? It's good for you. Now we've already got the earth. The earth is ours. We walk on it. We claim it. It's not for God. One day it'll be ours too. We move to blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Hunger and thirst for righteousness. What's that? 2 Timothy. All scripture is God breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. So that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. You should be hungering for that word. You should want to know what it says, what it means. Because when somebody asks you a question, you need to have the answer. Hmm? In the Old Testament it says, Be strong and very courageous. Be careful to obey all the law my servant Moses gave you. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left that you may be successful wherever you go. Do not let this book of the law depart from your mouth Meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Then you will be prosperous and successful. Remember the prayer at the beginning? May the meditation of my heart and the words of my mouth. Do not let the book of the law depart from your mind. There's um, a group in the Bible in Acts. They were called the Bereans. Now the Bereans were of more noble character than the Thessalonians. For they received the message with great eagerness and did what with it? Okay, they examined the scriptures every day to see if what Paul said was true. 
I use a lot of Bible verses. And the reason I use a lot of Bible verses is because I don't want to be this to be the day of show. I want this to be speaking the word of God. Paul's prayer in Philippians, and this is my prayer, this is what he says, and this is my prayer, that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight, so that you may be able to discern what is best and may be pure and blameless until the day of Christ. Why? Filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. We need to know Jesus. And John says, in the beginning was the Word. And the Word was, and the Word, who is the Word? Jesus. We need to know that. We need to be able to test everything. The next one, blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. I'm going to read this to you. It's in Luke. I do this just to show that I can't actually read. But it says this. But I tell you, but I tell you to hear me, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, pray for those who, who will treat you. If someone strikes you on one cheek, then bend the other also. If someone takes your cloak, do not stop you from taking your tunic. Give to everyone who asks you, and if anyone takes what belongs to you, do not demand it back. Do to others as you would have them do to you. If you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who are good to you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners do that. And if you lend to those from whom you expect repayment, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners expecting to be repaid in full. But love your enemies. Do good to them and lend to them without expecting to get anything back. Then your reward will be great and you'll be sons of the Most High, because he is kind to the ungrateful and wicked. Be merciful just as your Father is merciful. Blessed are the merciful. Does anybody know what the golden rule is? Every religion has this. Not only does every religion have it, but any, any sort of group have something similar to this golden rule. And it's simply this. If you read in verse 32, it says, Do to others as you would have them do to you. That's the golden rule. Every religion has that rule. Do it to others. Some of them say, do to others as you would have them do it to you, but do it first. Because they don't care. Be merciful. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. If you want mercy, be merciful. Show mercy. Forgive. Forgive. Why? Because it says, be merciful just as your Father is merciful. We talked about sins. Just imagine if we, if, we, if, if Jesus showed up now with a tally sheet and said, right, here's your sins, here's what you pay. Well, don't worry, I'll show you mercy. I'll show you mercy if you can tell me who you've been merciful to. Hmm? Be merciful, show mercy. Both in the physical world and in the spiritual world. Forgive those that you don't agree with. Don't hold grudges. It destroys you, it does not destroy them. Show mercy that you will be shown mercy. I'm not looking for mercy from people. I know people are hard. I know that I'll get no mercy from them. I know that they'll take advantage. But you know what? I have a God who will show me mercy. Jay stole Moody. I was like, Moody? Wow, that's, that's, that's not that much fun, are they? Jay stole Moody. It says this, Heart is used in Scripture as the most comprehensive term for the authentic person. 
It is part of our being where we desire, deliberate, and decide. It has been described as the place of conscious and decisive spiritual activity. The comprehensive term for a person as a whole is feelings, desires, passions, thoughts, understanding, and will are the center of a person. And then he says this, the place to which God turns. I know the desires of the heart. God does not look at the man and say, he's got brains, he's the one for me. When I look at the disciples, I don't think, what a brilliant bunch of men they were. They were fishermen. They were tax collectors, the people that people hated. But God said, I see what's deep in their heart. And that's what I'm going to use. And our reward is we will see God in heaven. We will worship him there. He says, in a loud voice, they were saying, This is the multitudes in front of the throne. In a loud voice they were saying, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honour and glory and praise. Start learning that because you won't be singing that. Huh? We're going to get to heaven and we're going to see God and we're going to be able to worship God freely, unhindered. And it doesn't say, wow, Jesus was super powerful. Remember the meek and mild? Worthy is the lamb who was slain. Who stood there meek and mild and submitted to God's will and did what God wanted him to do and died on a cross for me. Next verse, blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called sons of God. Blessed are the peacemakers. If you want to know what a peacemaker looks like, look to Jesus. Look to Jesus. When the adulterous woman was they were trying to stone her, he said, Whoa, whoa! If anybody's without sin, let them throw the first stone. He didn't say, Stop, or I will smite you down. He didn't say, go ahead, it's what you want to do. He was a peacemaker. He said, whoa, whoa, this is not necessary. I'm paraphrasing here. If any of you has not sinned, fine, go ahead. But if you've sinned, it's all we did, isn't it? You want peace in the world, it's that simple. When somebody says, we want to avenge ourselves on that, Say, so have you never wronged anybody? Oh, I've been ripped off. I've been ripped off. Have you never ripped anybody off? Whether you think it's done accidentally or on purpose? He said, pay unto Caesar what is Caesar's. You see, they're trying to go with Jesus. They're trying to get him to go. Let's, let's fight the Romans. No, no, pay unto Caesar what Caesar's. God puts the authorities over us. We don't get to choose them most of the time, but in this country we get elections, so we can. But the fact of the matter is, whether we've got an idiot who's in charge or, or, the, or the most caring genius in the world, it doesn't matter. God put him there. Or her. I have to say that because the conservative prime minister thing coming up. Give what's demanded. I don't like paying my taxes. I really don't. This year I could have done without paying them. I would have loved to have not paid them. But it's not my decision. You know what a peacemaker is? A peacemaker is when somebody is praying and they come to take him away and he knows what's coming. He knows he's going to get scourged, he's going to get insulted and, and, and mocked. 
They've got a bloody make him walk to the top of a hill, nail him to a cross, and he's going to die. And he knows that. And when they come for him, he said, and somebody pulls a sword out, he says, put your sword away. Put your sword away. Everybody who lives by the sword will die by the sword. So learn to make peace. Learn to make peace with those around you. Huh? When he was in the temple, he said, am I leading the rebellion that you come out with swords and clubs to capture me? You know what? I'm sat in the temple courts every day and you didn't bother. And now you come out like I'm an, an armed in, insurrectionist. He was tested. Is he a man of peace or is he not? Well, he was. There's a general uh, thought that maybe Judas Iscariot was trying to get Jesus, to do, he's trying to provoke Jesus to do, to do that. The powerful, miraculous things that he'd done, raising people from the dead and healing people. And he was trying to get him to do that against Rome. Huh? But no. Jesus is the Prince of Peace. You want to know, in Isaiah it says, but, and this is a, for Christmas, by the way, this is before he's born. For to us a child is born, for to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulder, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor. I will leave one, when I go, I'm going to leave a counselor. He will, Jesus called the Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Huh? We get to be children of of God. Why? To all who receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Children born not of natural descent or of human decision or of husband's will, but born of God. Born again. Children of God. That's what we are. Verse 10. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness. But theirs is the kingdom of heaven. We're going, to, we're going to really run through this now to the end real quick. Just so that you understand how many people are persecuted. Since Jesus came, how many people, how many Christians do you think have died? And they're still dying every day. How many people? Here's a rough estimate. 70 million Christians have laid down their lives. So understand this, when you read in Revelation, it says, there will be on number. 70 million Christians have laid down their lives for Jesus. Today, a Christian is going to die for the name of Jesus. Okay? In Revelation, it says, when he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain because of the word of God and the testimony they had maintained. They called out in a loud voice, How long, sovereign Lord, holy and true, until you judge the inhabitants of the earth and avenge our blood? Then each of them was given a white robe, and they were told to wait a little longer until the number of their fellow servants and brothers who had been killed, as they had been, were completed. The number's not been completed. There are still many more to die. And then a, bit, a bit further on it says, I looked and there was a great multitude that no one could count, from every nation, tribe, people and language, standing before the throne and in front of the Lamb. They were wearing white robes and were holding palm branches in their hands, and they cried out in a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God, who sits on the throne, and to the Lamb. A great multitude. If seven, roughly 70 million people have died so far, martyred for the, for, for, for the cause of Christianity, martyred because, they're martyred because they believe in the word of God, they believe that they were saved and they were willing to die for that. There are so many countries that oppress Christians. I'm going to name the top 10 for you. Okay? Afghanistan is the top one. 
North Korea, Somalia, Libya, Yemen, Eritrea, Neo Nigeria, Pakistan, Iran, and India. Some of the biggest countries in the world, some of the most powerful countries in the world, are persecuting Christians to death. In this country, Christians live a lovely life of peace for the most part. They might get a little bit of verbal abuse occasionally. But roughly one in seven Christians around the world faces oppression because they are Christians. One in seven. I can't believe it. 70 million people. this if the world hates you keep in mind that it hated me first hmm? if you belong to the world it would love you as its own as it is you do not belong to the world but I have chosen you out of the world that is why the world hates you remember the words I spoke to you no servant is greater than his master if they persecuted me, they will persecute you also. If they obeyed my teaching, they will obey yours also. They will treat you this way because of my name. For they do not know the one who sent me. If they have not come and spoken to them, they will not be guilty of sin. Now, however, they have no excuse for their sin. He who hates me hates my father as well. Hmm. should not expect the world to love us. I would suggest that for the most part, as a Christian, I am tolerated. No servant is greater than the master. If they have persecuted me, Jesus said, they will persecute you all. Blessed be you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Now I'm going to say something now. Me and Christa, in the last couple of weeks, have felt persecution. A young lady decided to write a review of the chip shop. This is what it says. Now, last time when I read it, I remember this is a review of my chip shop. Think about where this is telling me that we are doing something wrong in the chip shop. This is the review of the chip shop. The owners are supposed to be Christian, but they evict Mary and Joseph from the stable due to having no money to pay the rent. That's all it was saying. Is that a fair review of a chip shop? The owners are supposed to be Christian, but they'd evict Mary and Joseph from the stable due to having no money to pay the rent. And we have no recollection of saying a bad word to anybody. We have no recollection of saying, get out, give no money. We have no recollection at all. And it's not a review of the shop. And then within a few days, we got another message saying that someone had reported the Living Waters Facebook page to Facebook. And Facebook apologised that Living Waters had been accused falsely. We didn't know we even saw what we'd been accused of, did we? Facebook just sent us an apology saying, you have been accused falsely. Not us, us. Here's what it says. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven, for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Hmm? They persecuted the prophets that were before you. I know we don't often do this, but I'm going to just run very quickly. Simon Peter, murdered by Nero in Rome, AD 64. Andrew, his brother, 
crucified in Patras, that's Greece. James, son of Zebedee, died by the sword, but was after ten God. John, the brother of James, he died, the only one who died a natural death on Patmos. Philip, he was, he was killed after he converted the wife of, a, uh, I'm assuming, a Roman proconsul, and the proconsul took offence to it and killed him. Bartholomew, crucified in India. I gave you a list before, ten years. Ten countries that persecute Christians. So this has been going on for 2,000 years. Okay? Bartholomew, crucified in India. Thomas, stabbed with spears in India. Matthew, killed with a spear in Ethiopia. James, stoned to death in Jerusalem. Thaddeus, possibly killed by the bishops after he performed a miracle. They took offence to it and the bishops apparently came looking down and killed him. Simon, Simon the Zealot, no. He was either killed in Persia or Spain. Now that's not so far away from us. I'm sure a lot of us have been to Spain or Holland. Matthias stoned to death in Ethiopia. They got about a bit, didn't they? They got about a bit. But what, what does it say about them? Well, in Revelation, I'm not going to. Um, in Revelation 21. Right at the end of the book, I can find Revelation as well. Revelation 21. Okay? Verse 7 says this. He who overcomes will inherit all this, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. What's he going to inherit? The new Jerusalem. Thank you, Kate. There is an inheritance. There's always, if there's a blessing, there's a, a good thing coming. So here we go. Jesus came, and according to his um, Beatitudes, I'm going to call them the B attitudes. These are the attitudes we need to have. Jesus came as a servant, a comforter. He came and he was meek and mild. Okay? He created a desire to be with God. He was merciful, pure of heart, a peacemaker. Was he pure of heart? I'm going to tell you now, pure means untainted by anything. If you want God in your heart, you make a clean slate for him to come. You repent of all your sins, get him out there now. Get him cleaned out. Because God wants a pure heart. He was persecuted, insulted. He was followed along like prophet to death. Jesus led a righteous life because the Beatitudes are there to guide us in our everyday life and in our spiritual, in our spiritual life. Earlier on, talked about um, Monica Helwig, remember the 10 things. What is what you need to do? Remove the words the poor and substitute it with the words I. Okay? I. I asks, do my attitudes resemble those of the poor? Or do they resemble those of the rich? Do I acknowledge my needs? Do I put God first and depend on other people and God? Hmm? Where does my security rest? And then there is another one. Am I more likely to compete or cooperate? Can I distinguish between necessities and luxuries? And am I patient with other people than myself? Do, I, do the Beatitudes sound to me like good news or like a scolding? 
Do I, when I'm told the Beatitudes, do I listen to them and think, man, they're not going to go at me because I'm not this, I'm not merciful. Do I know my urgent need of redemption? Yes, I do. Thank you very much. I am blessed because I am blessed. I am blessed because I do more for the things I've done in our past life. I do try and be as meek as I can. And here's the thing when I'm not meek. When I rage like a lion, if I do it falsely, I know God will forgive me. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. I want nothing more. I want nothing more. And neither should you. I am blessed because I try and be merciful. Therefore, I will receive mercy. I am blessed because I try and keep a pure heart. Remember the burning in the meditations in my heart. I try and keep peace. I don't want conflict. But if it's conflict, sometimes it's the only way to keep peace. I'll face persecution because I know I have something greater. The last thing I want to leave you with is this. Do the Beatitudes sound to me like good news or like I'm being told off? When I read those Beatitudes, do I recognize me, myself, or do I think I'm so far away? Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Hmm. Does this sound like you're having a go at you? sound like the fault point of your fault time or does it sound like that's good news because I have the blessing I am blessed I am blessed I am blessed hmm? and here we go I am blessed because I am fully satisfied right now Finish with a prayer. So, Lord, thank you that uh, that even as we start, we start with the Sermon on the Mount and the Beatitudes. Let them be our attitudes. Let us not think more highly of ourselves. Let us be humble. Let us be merciful. Let us be pure in heart. Lord, we, we expect to receive those slings and arrows, but we know that when we take on the arms of God, they're protected. stand prepared before you to receive your blessing. For right now, we ask that you bless each one of us in Jesus' name.